Here, Allison, here, bottom. <laughs> Jason. All right. I'm so excited. All right, so like I said yesterday, you definitely do not have to take notes. If you wanted to have paper out in case there's anything I mentioned that um, you uh -oh. need to know more about, please do not interrupt or ask questions during the lecture or you will totally throw me off. Ready? All right, let's go. All right, so see if you remember this, perhaps. Um, there are three isms that started World War I. There's militarism, nationalism, and imperialism. So we are going to start with imperialism. At the turn of the century, 1900, countries all over Europe are competing for colonies overseas. The U.S. is also competing for colonies overseas. We have Hawaii now. We are in the Spanish American War, turn of the century. We have acquired Puerto Rico, Guam, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but for us, we're kind of isolated way over here. The Europeans, however, are competing against each other, and they're all neighbors. So they're all like competing against each other, and they share borders. So what ends up happening is when one of them gets a colony, they're like, woo, and the other neighbors are like, woo. So they want to like oust, like up their neighbors, so they begin building up a bigger military, and that's militarism. So the bigger military you have, the more proud you are, like, hey, that's right, we got the big military, and that's nationalism. So you have all of these countries in Europe that are building up their militaries and competing against each other for overseas colonies that is making them very proud and very prideful and very, like, we're better than you kind of thing, and that can only lead to trouble. However, that's not our fault. We're over here in America, like, whatever, we're like way over here, 3,000 miles away. Our problem happens in 1910. In 1910, Mexico has a revolution. And they oust their leader, who was our good friend, and they put in a new leader. And we are not sure what to make of this guy, but he's the new leader of Mexico. And we've decided we don't like him. And then in 1912, he is overthrown. So we like this guy. Only problem with this guy is he's a dictator. And what ends up happening in 1912 and 1913, there's another revolution in Mexico. And so while they're all fighting, we're watching this going, whoa, they're competing in Europe for you know, overseas colonies, and we're like, whoa. So we're just kind of like, whoa, 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 this is all crazy. But then in 1914, we get a new president in 1913, and in 1914, we have decided, the Americans, that we need to help the Mexican Revolution. Their newest leader is a bad person, and we want to help overthrow him. Now, we did not ask the Mexicans if they wanted our help, Instead, what we did in 1914 is the United States decided to occupy Veracruz. We sent the Navy, we blockaded Veracruz, and we sent the Marines into Veracruz, and we took over Veracruz. There was a reason for that. The dictator of Mexico was getting all of his supplies from Germany through Veracruz. So we blockaded the port, took over all of the weapons, and basically turned on the leader of Mexico. So he fled the country. The problem is, a lot of the Mexicans are angry at America. This is all part of World War I, by the way. A lot of the Mexicans are mad at Americans for what we had just done. However, everyone's attention in the world is distracted by one very small incident that is going to start all the fighting in World War I. But before I get to that, I have to draw you my very first Arango map. Spain, France, Germany, Austria-Hungary. Oh, I didn't bad job. Austria-Hungary, <laughs> Serbia, um, Italy, <laughs> and England. I'll label them for you in case you know you're not sure. Oh, and Belgium. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, Belgium, England. Perfect. There's your in the mind of Mr. Rango. All right. So, what has been going on while America is dealing with Mexico is nothing less than drama, and I do mean drama. Here's what's happened in the first 15 years of the 1900s. Oh, I forgot. Right. <laughs> All right. So apparently what is happening is this. There is drama between Austria-Hungary and Serbia. And I drew Serbia way too big. It's actually much smaller than this. Um, Serbia belonged to Austria-Hungary back in the day. Serbia declared their independence and declared themselves their own country. And Austria-Hungary said, well, we're going to get you back. So there's already friction between the two of them, and making the friction worse is a little piece of land right here called Bosnia. Bosnia was once a part of Serbia, and a lot of the people who live in Bosnia are still loyal Serbians, but they belong to Austria-Hungary. So the people in Austria-Hungary are very torn, and some of the major cities like Sarajevo are literally torn in half 
Half the people are loyal Austro-Hungarians, like you belong to us now, and if you don't like it, you can get out. And the other half are total Serbian nationalists who are like, shut up, Serbia's coming back for us, and we're not giving up our, our citizenship of Serbia. And what has happened in the streets of Sarajevo is you are oftentimes, especially as we get closer to 1914, and militaries are building up, we're starting to see a lot of street fights. And I don't mean street fights like, you know, like West Side Story, where they're like having dance-offs and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm talking like gunshots, stabbings between the Serbian nationalists and the Austro-Hungarian nationalists within cities in Bosnia. So everyone knows the two of these are going to go to war. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. They both have said it. So we know it's going to happen, but Serbia is so much smaller than Austria-Hungary, and their military is also so much smaller. So what Serbia did is they called Russia and said, hey, look, it's going to happen. We're going to war against Austria-Hungary, and we know that the two of you have issues. Austria and Hungary have had these issues for about 20 years where they can't decide on the border between Austria-Hungary and Russia. They both claim to own a piece of land in between them. And so Serbia called Russia and said, hey, how about this? When the two of us go to war, how about you join in? Austria-Hungary will have to fight a two-frontal war, which they won't be able to do. We'll get back Bosnia, and you guys can have your piece of land that you claim. And Russia said, deal. So Russia and Serbia make this pact against Austria-Hungary. Well, Russia's really big. And so when Austria-Hungary found out about the pact, they're like, oh, no, 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 no. So Austria-Hungary knew that there are issues between Russia and Germany. <laughs> and these issues are totally some that you guys can relate to. The leader of Russia and the leader of Germany are first cousins. Their grandma is Queen Victoria of England. And they can't stand each other. They're not like the happy cousins, like, hey, we're having a family reunion on Sunday. Do you want to come? They're the cousins that are like, Mike, she likes me better than you. Queen likes me better than you. Oh, no, she likes me better than you. You're ugly. You smell. That kind of cousin. They can't stand each other. So Austria-Hungary called the leader of Russia, I'm sorry, called the leader of Germany, and said, hey, listen, here's what's going on. Serbia is trying to turn Russia against me. How about this? When we go to war and Russia joins in, how about you go kick your cousin's butt? And Germany's like, any excuse to kick his butt, I'm in. Like, okay. So now Austria-Hungary and Germany have kind of like started talking. Well, when Russia found out, he's like, oh, no, no, no. What are you, what are you trying to, my cousin trying to turn against me? That's so typical of my cousin. Well, you know what? Two of us can play this game. So the leader of Russia called the leader of France, knowing that Germany and France had fought over Alsace-Lorraine for like years and years and years and years and years. So he said, hey, man, you will not believe what my cousin's trying to do. And France was like, why believe it? I cannot stand him. He is like, you are something in the world. I'm like, I know, I know. So Russia talks to France about, if this whole thing blows up, will you help me double team my cousin? And France is like, what the fuck? So <laughs> Russia and France were like, yeah, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. In the meantime, the leader of Germany has decided to announce to the entire world that Germany now has greatest navy in Berg. And England's like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, if you did not know, um, England has always had the best navy. We've had the best navy for like 300 years. And Germany like, no more. German Navy great navy. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I'm telling you, it's our navy. And Germany like, no, your navy stupid little pussy navy. <laughs> Germany great navy. <laughs> and England's like, so France calls and says, I hear you're having problems with the oh, Well, you know what? Russia and then what happened? So, <laughs> England, France, and Russia form what is known as the Triple Entente, an alliance against Germany. Well, Germany finds out, like, oh, 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 well, you know what? I can play this game, too. And they called Italy. Why? Because Italy and France have been fighting over who should really control the waters of the Mediterranean. So Germany called Italy and said, hey, us and Austria-Hungary have this sort of thing going on where, you know, if we go to war, the three of us are going to take down France. And, and Italy's like, I'm in. So Italy, Austria-Hungary, and Germany form a pact as well, the Triple Alliance, where the Central Powers preserve the center of Europe. So, I mean, how could this possibly be a good thing? We have these two huge alliances, and you know at any moment, as soon as one of them goes to war, everyone's going to war. So then the event happens, which I know you already know, but you have to let me tell my story my way, that's going to start the fighting for World War I. And it happens one fateful day in June of 1914. 
Now, if it was up to me, I would totally make this into a movie. It would be black and white because it's 1914. And it would have really cool music like this. In fact, I think I shall act it out for you. <laughs> On this fateful day, June 25th, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his lovely wife Sophie <laughs> have traveled to the chaotic city of Sarajevo. Now, Archduke Ferdinand is heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne. His father is the emperor. His father sent him to Sarajevo because that is the city where people are literally fighting in the streets to kind of try to like promote peace, of like a peace mission. Well, at the same time, there's a military base there and he wants to make sure that it's doing good because they're almost at war with Serbia. So he's got kind of a dual mission for going there. So on the morning of June 25th, Archduke Ferdinand and his wife show up. They get on the train. They get off the train. She's there in there. As they are driving down the street. Oh, let me also mention my movie. <laughs> As they're driving down the street, someone throws a bomb at the car. It bounces off the trunk and lands on the floor. It's on a detonator. Franz Ferdinand and his car get away. The car behind him. <laughs> People running. They get him to safety. He makes it to town hall. He goes into town hall. They're trying to decide what to do. He's like, forget everything else I had planned for the day. I want to go see my men who were injured. They're like, okay. His wife's like, I'm going to. He's like, <laughs> so back to my movie. In slow motion. They walk down the steps. There's a crowd gathered. The crowd is cheering. <laughs> There's a little kid screaming. I don't know why, but every movie there's always little kids screaming. <laughs> <laughs> a balloon is flying through the air. Our friends, Bertie Dan and lovely wife Sophie, get into their convertible car. And begin driving down the street. Unbeknownst to Archduke Ferdinand and his lovely wife Sophie, down the street and around the corner, are seven guys, and in my movie they'd all be wearing trench coats with their hats pulled down below, and they'd be standing there like this. <laughs> and they're just Ferdinand turns the corner. His car gets closer. The seven guys <laughs> start walking. <laughs> car is closer. They get faster. Car is closer. They walk faster. The car is closer. Suddenly, one of them pulls out a gun, and you hear. <laughs> and it's just like the major. <laughs> and Archie Ferdinand goes. <laughs> <laughs> A second bullet rings out. <laughs> <laughs> Sophie and her unborn child. Oh, no. oh that's happening. Okay. <gasps> they check them out. Why'd you do it? Oh, wait, slow motion. Why'd you do it? <laughs> <laughs> he did it. The 19 year old gunman. Because I am Serbian, and he is not my leader. Serbia has assassinated the Archduke, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne. My movie's over, by the way. End credits. Okay. <laughs> now, Serbia's like, <laughs> hold up, seriously, you think I had sent a 19-year-old hitman after your guy? That wasn't me. But what a great excuse. Austro-Hungary claims Serbia assassinated the son, the emperor's son. They have to pay, and Austria Hungary declares war on Serbia. So the moment Austria Hungary declares war on Serbia, Serbia calls Russia, Russia declares war on Austria Hungary. As soon as that happens, Austria Hungary calls Germany, Germany declares war on Russia, so France declares war on Germany. Germany decides to change their mind, circles around, destroys poor Belgium on the way, and attacks France. England finds out, they get really mad, and they declare war on Germany, and Italy just declares war on everybody. <laughs> so now, all of Europe is at war, and America's like this. <laughs> so now the world is at war. Now the reason why World War I is so bloody, and the bloodiest war we have seen up until we get to World War II, is we have new weapons. Lots of really cool weapons, but also really dangerous weapons. 
like tanks, like airplanes, like machine guns, like poisonous gases, we have grenades. We have a lot of really new weapons that are gonna create a massive pileup of dead bodies. And it doesn't help that trench warfare has engulfed the area. And now we have people stuck in trenches in very unsanitary conditions, which have a big mess over there in Europe. As far as America is concerned though, it is really not our, our problem. America's stand is neutrality. We are not getting involved in this problem. None of that drama is our drama, none of it. Our problem is really dealing with our neighbor to the south. Now, once that Mexican dictator flees, they do get a new one. And we get along okay for now. Um, so that is basically 1914. As we get into 1915, the war is still raging in Europe. Um, England has blockaded Germany. And their whole point being, you said you had the biggest, baddest navy, well prove it, here's my navy. And what England did not know, the reason that Germany said they had the greatest navy, is they had invented this really cool new thing called a submarine that you can't see, that has something like torpedoes on board. So as England begins blockading it, they keep getting hit by these unseen ships, and it's destroying their navy. So England keeps sending more and more ships to the blockade. In the meantime, German forces, land forces, have started fighting the French in the trenches, unveiling these horrific weapons of poisonous gases, mustard gas, chlorine gas, so inhumane. The death is like 20 or 30 minutes of struggling and gasping. Horrible weapons. And France is telling England, you would not believe the inhumane weapons that Germany has. They're taking chemicals and using them to chemical weapons. So England decides that their blockade not only are they going to stop you know, weapons from getting to Germany, they have to stop any kind of chemical from getting to Germany. So if an American ship came by and said, hey, I'm going to trade with Germany, they would let us through as long as we're not trading weapons or chemicals. They won't let chemicals in either. And the main reason I'm telling you that is because fertilizer is a very powerful chemical. And England already said no fertilizer. It's too powerful of a chemical. It can make a very powerful bomb. But the German farmers, who aren't even involved in the war, without fertilizer cannot grow food. Now what ends up happening by the end of the war, 750,000 Germans die of starvation because they couldn't grow food. But it's war, it's ugly, and this is what happened. So England's blockading Germany. Germany is losing a lot of civilians and all the food that is being produced is going to the military, which is continuing to fight the war on both fronts. Now, right around May 4th or so, um, the Lusitania is hit. Most of you know about the Lusitania. It's an English passenger ship. It's torpedoed by a German U-boat. 1,200 people die. 128 Americans. No warning. And so the family of the Americans and our president, Woodrow Wilson, is demanding an explanation of how you could kill civilians. No warning. And Germany was like, well, we warned them. And we're like, no, no, no. Survivors said there was no warning. And Germany's like, ah, stop, stop, stop. We put warning in newspaper. And it was true. They put an ad in all the London and English papers that said anyone who sails in the war zone does so at their own risk. That was their warning. So it's fair game. And it is true. That is a warning. But it's not a great warning. If you didn't read the paper, you know. So we. We let it slide, and we told Germany in the future, if you're going to destroy a civilian ship, you are allowed to do that in the rules of war, but you're supposed to warn them. So in the future, if that's what you're going to do, to give them a verbal warning so they can get the women and children off the ship. Germany said, okay. So we let it slide. 128 Americans dead, but it's okay. All right, we got, we got the situation down. So <clears throat> later on, in 1915, Italy's a little bothered by all of this. They joined the war because they wanted to take down France. They saw France as their biggest threat. But as the war is progressing, Italy is starting to see France isn't the big threat. It's Austria-Hungary. And they're on the same side. So at the end of 1915, Italy decides that they can't take it anymore. Even though they do not like France, Austria-Hungary is the bigger threat. And so at the end of 1915, Italy switches sides. So now they're fighting on the side of, of England and France and Russia. But boy, Germany and Austria-Hungary have made their own friends as well. They've gotten other countries, including the Ottoman Empire, to join with them as well. So the fight is getting bigger. All right, we get to 1916. 
A couple things happened in 1916. The first one is another German U-boat sinks a French liner called the Sussex and kills a whole bunch of innocent civilians as well. So the United States and our president, again, went to, England, uh, to Germany and said, look, killing civilians again. You told us that you would stop doing this. And Germany's like, why are you yelling at us about killing civilians? That little British blockade that's going on, you know how many of my civilians they're killing? I don't see you complaining to England that they're killing German civilians. And Woodrow Wilson's like, hey, man, I'm just trying to keep the peace. And, and Germany's like, okay, look, you want us to stop killing civilian ships? You tell England to stop killing our civilian farmers. And Wilson's like, okay. So he goes to England, he's like, um, they said they stopped killing ships, if you stop in England, like, and give them chemicals? That's exactly what they want. They want our chemicals. No, no way. Not gonna happen. And Wilson's like, hey man, I tried. Okay, I tried. However, on our side of the world, there is a Mexican named Pancho Villa. And you guys will get to learn all about him next semester. Yay to you. Um, he's kind of been harboring this grudge against America ever since we occupied Veracruz. And he thought the new Mexican president was going to give America the what for, for you know, what had happened in Veracruz. And the new president of Mexico is not doing anything about it. So Pancho Villa decided to do it on his own. Got a bunch of his little bandit friends. They crossed the border into the United States. They laid siege to the town of Columbus, New Mexico, and killed Americans and then cross back across to Mexico. Technically a terrorist act on US soil, so the President of the United States ordered 1,000 US troops to go find Pancho Villa. Ordered them to cross over into Mexico and find him and bring him back for justice. 1,000 US troops cross over into Mexico. The president of Mexico said, wait, what? There's American troops in Mexico? What are you talking about? They're like, yep. He was, I mean, he's no friend of Pancho Villa, but this is invasion. So he called the president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, and said, um, why do you have a thousand troops in my country? And he's like, well, we're after a fugitive. And he's like, okay, but extradition says that you're supposed to ask permission to do stuff like this, and you didn't ask. And Woodrow Wilson said, I'll take the troops out once we find him. And the president of Mexico was like, oh no, you can take them out now. And the president of the US said, I'll take them out when we find him. And the president of Mexico was like, oh no hung up the phone, called up the Mexican army, and said, prepare for war with the US. Mexican army's like, okay. So now the Mexican army's like, training for war against the US, rumors of this hit the US, and the Americans are like, yeah, let them come! See what's gonna happen to you. That's what we're dealing with? Europe is dealing with this, and craziness, and like death, and blood, and, but it's not our problem, and never has been. In November of 1916, Woodrow Wilson run for re-election, on the platform that he kept us out of war, which is true. He has kept us out of the bloodiest war the world has ever seen. Yes, we're having problems with Mexico, but this is so minor. Besides, no one in America really thinks that it's actually gonna be a war. It's just kind of like, a, hmm, that's a war. And we're not in it, thank you, Woodrow Wilson. So he is reelected. In January of 1917, I'm sorry, so he is reelected in November of 1916. In January of 1917, Woodrow Wilson makes a plea to all the leaders of Europe saying that we should have a peace without victory, that we should just stop fighting. No winners, no losers, just stop. And every country in Europe is like, shut up! Like, what are you talking about? If we stop fighting now without winning, every one of our people die for nothing. We fight till we win, every country. So that means they're all gonna fight till they win. So until there's a winner, they will be fighting. Walter Wilson was like, hey man, I'm just trying to help. But a lot of European countries were kind of like offended by Wilson's sort of like, I'm gonna come save the world attitude to them. To the point that the leader of Germany announced about a week later that from now on, we will sink all ships in the war zone. They already sink all ships in the war zone. The only ship they have never sunk is an American. So we took that as a threat, exactly as it was meant. So Germany has threatened to sink unarmed civilian American ships. American companies like, oh, just try it. Just try it. Like, you don't scare us. You would never touch us. So we're being threatened by Germany. We've never threatened Germany. We've traded with Germany through the whole war. So we're a little bothered by Germany's whole little 
uh, we're going to sink your ships now attitude. A couple weeks later in February, an uh, uh, officer in Germany named Zimmerman sent a telegram to um, the, the head of the German embassy in Mexico City. So from a German officer in Germany to the German embassy in Mexico City. The note said to talk to the Mexican president about an alliance with Germany and Mexico against the United States. That if Mexico were to declare war on the US, that Germany would join in. Now, the telegram was intercepted by a British spy and given to the United States. So we have it. So we published it in the newspaper. Thank you, you know, William Randolph Hearst. And it basically told the American people, look at what Germany's doing. First they threatened to sink our ship, and now they're trying to turn our neighbor against us in war. And now Mexico said they would not have done it, but I mean, we really don't know, right? We're already at odds. But that's why the Zimmerman note was sent. It was sent because there was already friction between the U.S. and Mexico, and Germany was trying to play on that. Well, <clears throat> we got the note. Now Americans are really mad. Like they threaten us to try to turn our neighbors against us. Who does Germany think they are? And then that's in February. So January they threaten us. February they sent the, the Zimmerman note. And then in March, German U-boats sink four unarmed civilian American merchant ships, killing 36 Americans. And that is the last straw. They threaten us. They try to turn our neighbors against us. They have deliberately killed Americans. And Americans want war. So in April, the United States declares war on Germany. Now, we did not declare war on everyone. We declared war on Germany, because they're the ones we want. This is um, April of 1917. We are so not prepared for this war, I can't even begin to tell you. We have 200,000 soldiers total. And it's not like we just deploy them immediately, because that would leave our border unprotected with our friction still with Mexico. We need a draft, we need it now. We will draft four million men in the next year. Problem is training them. We will spend six months training them on every tactic that we know that we're so successful in the Spanish-American War and the Civil War. Unfortunately, the Spanish-American War and the Civil War did not have machine guns, tanks, or any of those weapons. So we're training our soldiers old school. When they get to Europe, they will be completely unprepared for the bloodshed they're about to face with weapons they're not familiar with. So we spend six months training them from now until November. In November, we throw the czar. Now, they're college kids. That would be like you guys in a year meeting at Starbucks talking about how we should have a revolution in America. And you're all like, what does she know? Um, but Tsar Alexander knew he had to make an example of them, so he had them all arrested. And then decided that to really push the point to all college kids and all Russians that this will never happen in Russia, he decided to have them all publicly hung and had all their families come watch so that no, no, no families would ever want their kid to go through this. Um, so one of them, of the family members that showed up, is a 12-year-old kid who's sitting there watching his older brother standing on a chair with a noose around his neck, and then they kicked the chair. And he had to sit there and watch his brother's hang, or his brother hang, and he swore he'd make the czar, he's 12, he swore he'd make the czar pay, but his name is Vladimir Lenin, and he will make the czar's pay. He dedicates his life any way he could. He was exiled multiple times. All right, he will make the czars pay. So during this time, while Lenin is gathering supporters against the czar, um, Alexander forced his um, son Nicholas to marry Alexandra, who's Prussian. He's trying to like kind of mend the peace, all right, between Prussia and Russia. And so he has his son marry her. And Alexandra is incredibly paranoid, like super paranoid. Like, more than you know of anyone. Like, if you have friends that you're standing at the lunch line, and they're like, hey, those girls are laughing at us. And you look, and they're fully not. Your friends are like all paranoid, because they think that everyone's always talking about them. That's Alexandra. And it's worse, because she's an outsider. So when she comes in, everyone is talking about her. <laughs> um, so on the day that, I mean, not the day, Alexander dies, and Nicholas has to get coronated. And at the coronation, at the palace, um, the pope himself is going to put, like, literally the crown on his head. It's like a huge ceremony. All the rich people are there at the palace. And Nicholas and Alexander are walking to the, t to the front where the Pope is waiting for them. And on their way there, the crucifix around his neck falls to the floor. Now, you have to understand, this is a very Catholic country at the time. And when that happened, everyone was like, because in old school Catholicism, that's a bad omen. 
Those of you who have little abuelitas at home that are old school superstitious, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. All right, that is a bad omen. And so everyone was like, oh. Amanda's like faster than Twitter. Everyone was, everyone, everyone knew. I could not believe it. All he did, he picked it up, walked back up to the front, got coronated, and everyone was like, yay, yay. <laughs> so outside the palace gates that day, a crowd of peasants had gathered, like two or 300,000 of them. It's tradition. Whenever a new czar is coronated, peasants show up around the castle. They're not allowed in because, you know, they're peasants. Um, but they can stand around and, you know, they sit up there and then he comes out and he waves at them all and they're all like, hey, hey. And then if you show up, you get a little present. It's not worth anything. It's more tradition than anything. So all these peasants showed up and the rumors started to spread that there were no presents for them. And so they were like, who does he think he is? He marries a woman that's not even Russian and now he's got no presents for us. And so they're like, like, ramming the gates and, you know, they're creating all this uh, off of a rumor that isn't even true. So, Tsar Nicholas is inside, and he hears all this commotion outside. You know, you had 200,000 people screaming, it's gonna, you're going to be able to hear it. He's like, what's going on? The guards are like, oh, sir, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. You know, they just, I don't know, there some rumor spread that you don't have presents for them, and they're all like, Ugh, don't worry about it. Once we hand the presents out, they'll be fine. And Tsar Nicholas is like, oh, no, no. They do not tell me what to do. I am their Tsar. They do what I say. You go out there, and you tell them there are no presents for them, and that they can now go home. And the guards are like, okay. So the guards go out there, Zar says, there's no presents for you, and you all are to go home now. And the peasants were all like, oh, it's true. He's breaking tradition. And so they're all upset. And so the guards were ordered by Nicholas that if the peasants refused to leave, he, they were to shoot him. So they did. A <clears throat> couple thousand of them dead, and everyone took off running. This is his first day as Tsar. Things don't get better. Mm -hmm. So they started having children, Nicholas and Alexander. They have a girl, a girl, a girl, a girl, and a boy. Now, according to the laws of succession, the boy inherits everything. Don't worry, the girls will marry rich people. They'll be fine. Um, so poor little Alexei is supposed to inherit everything, and he has hemophilia. So most kids with hemophilia don't live past two or three at the time. So Alexander, who's already super paranoid, like doesn't let him play with anyone because he's always sick. And she's afraid, you know, if he starts playing with kids, they'll get too rough and then that'll happen. So she doesn't let her little boy play with any of the other rich little boys. So everyone thinks she's a little snob. I can't believe what Alexander did. She won't let him play. She doesn't want anyone to know he's sick. So when he's eight years old, he gets so sick, he almost dies. He's like literally on his deathbed like, and Alexander is hysterical. Of course, so you're a mom, your boy's about to die. And they tried everything, all the doctors, and no one could save him. And so one of her servants was like, well, Alexander, we've heard about this priest who has the palace poison. And she's like, well, send for him, send for him. And so the priest shows up. His name is Rescue. He's like, how can I help you? And she's like, my boy, and Rasputin took one look at the situation and knew exactly what had happened. The kid had a nervous breakdown. Like, his mom's so hysterical that the poor kid's like, and so he stopped eating, and you know, he's like a mess. And so Rasputin said, I can heal him, but I need the room completely cleared of everyone, including you, Alexander. And she's like, no, no, and he's like, mm. and she's like, so he leaves. And so all Rasputin does is he tells him stories and calms his nerves, and then he falls asleep, and he wakes up, he's hungry, so we fed him, and in two or three days, he's fine. And Alexander's like, oh, he truly do have sick in this. He's like, yes. <laughs> he ever me again, call me. Okay. So, they go to war. In the first two months of fighting the Germans, Russia loses 200,000 men. Two months! And Nicholas believes it's because they, they are lacking like morale. Like they need like a, someone to go and like boost their morale. So he decides he's gonna do it. And Alexander's like, who's gonna run the country while you're gone? And he's like, why well, you are, my dear. And then he leaves. And she's like, everyone hates me. Everyone hates me. You're gonna be gone. I'm gonna lose the gun. I have an idea. So she sends for rescue. And rescue shows up like this. You know, they both take it for you. He's like, um, I would like you to run the country. And he's like, okay, on one condition. And she's like, anything. And he's like, I want 
to be with her. And she's like, of course. I mean, in her mind, she's thinking you're a man of God. If you want to know what to do, you just be like, God, what should I do? God, pay respect, do this. And then he'll do it. And it'll be like, God's running the country. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, he's a holy man, saved the son, good guy. So she gives him complete control. He's like, so you all know, and of course, the first thing he does is raise taxes, and then poor people can't pay him, so he throws them all in jail. Then he does the unthinkable. Tax the nobles. No one's ever taxed the nobles. Like, no one. And they're like, we're not going to pay taxes. He's like, oh, you're going to pay taxes, or you're going to end up in debtor's prison with the peons. And they're like, you. And he's like, <laughs> and they're like, so they go to Alexandra, and they're like, Alexandra, you have to do something. You know, the prisons are overflowing, you know, all the, you know, with all the men in jail, the women have no money to feed their kids, and malnutrition's on the rise, and he's taxing us. And the you have got to do something. You have to fire him. And Alexandra's like, I know, I'm hearing all these terrible things, but he's a man of God. Like, how do you fire a man of God? And they're like, You're, you gave him the power. You can take it away. And Rasputin gets wind of it, and he's like, hmm. So he goes to Alexandra, and he's like, Alexandra, I have had a vision. God has told me that if you betray me, you and your son will not last six months. And she's like, I mean, he's basically threatening that if you fire me, your kid will be dead in six months and I won't save him. So she won't risk it. So she doesn't do anything. And the nobles are like, oh, we'll do it ourselves. So the nobles plot to kill Rasputin, but they don't want him to know. So they invite him to a party. We'll discuss the whole taxes thing, you know, over a feast. And Rasputin's like, okay. So they have this party planned. They have this big dining room table with all the fancy silverware and all of this. And they have, you know, they have assigned seats for parties like this. So at Rasputin's seat, they have the goblet of wine, and they put enough poison in it to kill two men. They drink the wine, you can die, and they're going to say it was a heart attack. Good job. High five, high five. Okay. So Rasputin shows up, and he goes to his desk, and the, or his desk, his, uh, his seat. And they're all sitting around, they're like, yeah, let's do yeah, go. The wine's really good, you should try it. And he's like, oh, I will. So he's eating and drinking, eating and drinking, and he's talking and eating and drinking. And he finishes his wine, and he's just eating, and they're all like, you're so <laughs> So, for two hours. And they're all like this, like. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, after two hours, the poison starts to affect him. And he's like, you poisoned me. You all poisoned me! You're on! They're all freaking out because he's not dying! So finally, one of them just can't take it anymore, just pulls out a gun and shoots him. And they're like, okay, so now he's on the ground. And they're like, well, I guess we can't save the heart. <laughs> Still safe like a bird we got mom. So they're all like, oh, God, you have a dead body. You know, we shot him. We can say that it's happening. We won't hear it. So they all kind of leave the room. And for whatever reason, I still don't know, two of them decided to come back in. So they come back in, like dead body, it's kind of creepy. They come back in, and I guess, I don't know if they were going to check the body, or if they were walking by the body. All I can tell you is that one of Rasputin's hands flung up, like in the horror movies, grabbed one of their ankles, pulled himself up, and was like, you shot me! You pushed me! And you shot me! And they're both like, ah! So everyone heard the scream, so they all run in, they all see Rasputin, and they're all like, and he's like yelling about how they're all gonna pay and blah blah blah. So one of them pulls out a gun and he's shaking. So he's like, and he shoots him and he shoots him in the shoulder. And so he's like, you shot me again. <laughs> and then he realizes like, so they freak out. They start grabbing chairs and candlesticks and they're just like beating him. They're beating him. And they're just like, da, 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 da. and then there's this big bloody mess on the ground. They're all like. <laughs> You think he's dead? I don't know. Like, no, what are you gonna do? We can't do it. They're like, okay, so we gotta get rid of the body. So they tie him in chains, and then they take him to the bridge and they throw his body in the river. Like his body will wash up. We'll be like, we don't know what happened. He left here. He was fine. So his body washes up like a week later, and they do an autopsy. Just FYI, cause of death: drowning. <laughs> no, really, that's the cause of death. Is drowning, not bludgeoning or you know gunshot. Or poison. Okay, so but he is dead. So this happens right at the end of 1916. So we get to 1917. Germany threatens us. They send the no. They kill Americans. And in the meantime, all the people that had gone to jail while resting was there are still in jail. And by March, they've made it through winter. There's no food, and the women of Petrograd, the city 
have decided they don't care, they have to get food for their kids. So they went literally to town and went into all the stores and just stole the food. Left the money, stole the food. Well, they called the police, the police showed up, and the police saw what was going on in Petrograd. I mean, how do you arrest these women for doing nothing but stealing food for their starving children? So the police started participating. Then it became all out of control looting. And this is the police. So when that happened in Petrograd, it spread everywhere. Unrest, just with what had happened under Rasputin and desperation, caused total chaos everywhere throughout Russia. And Alexander didn't know what to do. Rasputin's dead, her husband's still off. And so she sends him a message like, you have to come home. So 1917, this is the summer now, Nicholas agrees, okay, I'll come back. And so on his way back on the train, they were like, what, what, is, what, is, what do the people want? And they said, the people want you to step down to abdicate. And he's like, well, I'll do it if my cousin, and not, not crazy cousin. Um, one of his cousins here, he's like, I'll let him be in charge. And the cousin was like, mm, I don't want this. And so in the end, he agrees to abdicate. And so he abdicates the throne, fully believing he would be back in a year. Um, but once he abdicated, that left the Congress or Parliament in charge. And Parliament was kind of like, we were still at war. And Parliament was kind of like, okay, now what are we going to do? You know, we're going to make some new laws. And this is when Lenin saw his opportunity. Lenin and his underground army that he has built for the last 40 years puts on their secret uniforms and take over the parliament and take over the government. Arrest Nicholas and his family and they'll kill them all. Um, but they have taken over Russia in the middle of World War I. And Lenin understood that you can't start a new government and a new way of life and do everything while you have millions of men fighting. So he called the leader of Germany and said, I want out of the war. And I'm sure the leader of Germany's like, thank God. Because now I can take all the soldiers that were fighting you and fight the Americans that are starting to show up. So <clears throat> the Russian Revolution starts in November, which is the time the Americans are landing. It was good timing for Germany. So Russia pulls out of the war early, and all those German soldiers come to fight us, and now we have to face them as well. But they are tired. They've been fighting for three years, and we just got off the boat, literally. And we're ready to go. Yes, we're not very well trained, but France can retrain us, and they will. And once we start getting into the war, we bring food, we bring supplies, we bring everything we can. We don't have a lot of weapons, we didn't build them all, but we can use their weapons. We're fresh faces, we're ready to go. And we start beating Germany. By now, Austria-Hungary's had a revolution and they have pulled out of the war. Romania, Bulgaria, the Ottoman Empire have all had revolutions and pulled out of the war. All that's left is Germany. And so Germany alone, who's tired and weak, isn't gonna last very long. And on November 11, 1918, um, Germany surrenders. The leader of the country, just so you know, on November 9th, like all good leaders do when they realize they've lost, he fled the country, <laughs> leaving no leader in Germany. So the German government agreed to, um, to quit, to stop the war on November 11th. Now, that's only the stopping of the fighting. That's not actually the treaty. So the armistice ends the fighting. November 11th is actually known as Armistice Day. We changed it to Veterans Day after World War II. In Europe, it is still known as Armistice Day, the day the fighting ended in World War I. However, that is not the treaty. It is also not what happens to our soldiers when they come home. They are gonna have to, and we're, we'll talk about this later when they come home, we call them the 14 points. Put them all together, and like when we get together, these are things we should go through. And when the leaders met in Versailles, to decide the fate of Europe. What are we gonna to do to punish the losers? How are we gonna punish Austria-Hungary? Let's start with Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary had a revolution. So what we do with Austria-Hungary, which you can no longer see because it's been destroyed by, I don't know who, I think Italy destroyed them, in mind. There, perfect. Um, what we do with Austria-Hungary, since it had a revolution, the people are split, is we actually do split up Austria-Hungary. A small country called Austria, a small country called Hungary, part of it is given to a new country, called Poland. We're we'll talk about Poland in just a moment. Part of it is given to a new country called Czechoslovakia, and we reunite Serbia with Bosnia, with an additional part, with part of Albania, and create a brand new country called Yugoslavia, which is interesting because the Serbian and the Austro-Hungarian can't stand each other, and Albanians hate Serbians. <laughs> this is a good idea. Let's put them all in one country. <laughs> we'll deal with them later, too. All right, so we split them up. Ottoman Empire, of course, destroyed as well. Everyone else is destroyed. What is left is Germany. Russia wants to destroy Germany. Destroy it, split it up into as many small pieces as we can, never let it be again. 
And nobody else kind of agrees with that, so Russia's not going to get their way on that. The only problem is Russia isn't there. They're not invited. And Russia was like, what do you mean we're not invited to Versailles? Like, we lost more people than anyone fighting the Germans. How could you tell us? And they're like, well, you pulled out early. In fact, part of the Versailles Treaty, for those of you who didn't know, is to punish Russia for pulling out early. They lose part of their land to Poland. They also lose Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, their three access points to the Arctic, their biggest trade cities. We will destroy them. Russia will never forgive us for this. Why? We fought so hard for this, and this is, this is what we get. We lose. We'll deal with that later, too. Um, but what about Germany? We have to deal with Germany. It's France, it's us, it's England, and Italy's there too. We have to decide what to do with Germany. So we decide that Germany, we're not going to let them ever, ever, ever be powerful again. We will give them an army the size of Belgium's army. It's like 70,000 people. That's as big as their army can be. Which of course means that Germany, all those millions of people that were in the army, are now unemployed. We are going to shut down all their factories so they cannot produce weapons anymore. So all the people who work in factories in Germany are now unemployed. We are going to make Germany pay back every country that fought against them, every dime we spent fighting them. The US alone is 30 billion. And we were only in it for a year. England and France, it's in the hundreds of billions, and you will pay us back every dime you owe us. And Germany's like, how? No one's working? You destroyed our military, our factories? And we're like, oh, you'll find the money. And what about the leader of Germany? We'll put in a new government in Germany, the Weimar Republic, which you all know so well from this costume class. You're like, we have an imposter. That was like two years ago. Um, but yes, and so we put in the government of Germany, who is going to sign the Versailles Treaty, agreeing to all of A lot of people in Germany resented them already. You agree to this? To the factories? To the military? To the reparations? Yes. So Americans come home, war is over, and we move on to the 1920s. Thank you.